Hello and thank you for joining with me in my online Bible study. If this is your first time with me, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to share with you my knowledge and my understanding of Scripture. If you are a repeat viewer, I also want to thank you for coming back and returning. Do you agree with many pastors that God wants to make you rich? I guess we have to ask ourselves the question, does God really want us to be wealthy? Well, some may believe that uh, God will make them wealthy by making them famous and successful. Some believe that if they pray hard enough and long enough, that God will help them get a, a bigger house and a better car, or maybe get that promotion that they've been hoping for, and of course, think that they deserve. Another very popular theme is that if you give enough money to the church, that God will reward you by giving you back double or maybe even triple or more of that amount. So if you expect God to bring you these kinds of rewards for your service, you probably need to stop this video right now at this point, because that isn't what this video is about. But you're more than welcome to stay and watch or listen to what Jesus actually says about the kinds of rewards or treasures, as he calls them, that we will be given as his followers. So, does God really want us to be wealthy? Well, of course he does. But maybe not the kind of wealthy that many are teaching and promising today. The wealth that God gives us is spiritual wealth, not material wealth. It was promised to us through what I, I kind of call parallel verses uh, that make a connection between the physical world and the spiritual world. Uh, or physical rewards and spiritual rewards in this case. Many things in the Old Testament were referenced to the physical world, but they also had a spiritual counterpart. And this is explained much better than I can in the book of Hebrews. So I recommend that you study that book when you can. It will help you see that this parallelism between the physical world and the spiritual world actually exists. And this is a lot of what the lessons were about in the Old Testament. But the physical world, along with its wealth, was only a token of the spiritual wealth that is the true wealth that God promised. As both Paul and the author of Hebrews, he called them shadows of things to come. But it seems that many pastors and many teachers are having a hard time getting past the shadows of the physical world and into the spiritual kingdom of God. I guess that you can't have shadows unless you have light. Believers prosper in spiritual things. And Jesus taught us not to seek out worldly rewards, but to seek out spiritual treasures that would last forever. He says this in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21 from the King James Version. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So it's obvious from this verse that Jesus was not promising us bigger houses and sports cars, but he continues in Luke chapter 18, verse 22. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that you hast, and distribute it unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. What a great and wonderful invitation. Would you give up all your wealth to be able to walk with Jesus? That's the question that you need to ask yourself. 
because what you really value as treasure, as Jesus put it, is truly where your heart is. Many can fool themselves into thinking that their heart is pure, but one must look at the things that they treasure to know for sure. But how do we go about seeking these spiritual treasures that Jesus is speaking about? And exactly what are they? Well, I believe that the means by which we seek these treasures are threefold. Faith, hope, and love. With faith, I think that Jesus wants us to seek by faith because it's faith that's behind many of the other treasures that he wants us to have. In a sense, Faith is the starting point of our own eternity, and therefore the beginning of our eternal quest for treasures. Faith enables us to see beyond our physical limits into eternity, so that we can see that parallelism, in other words, between the physical world and the spiritual world. The next is hope. Hope helps us to see beyond our present circumstances so that we can overcome the daily problems that exist in all our lives. How do we overcome them? Well, not always by solving them, but by letting those problems transform us, as we're going to see in a few minutes. And the third one is love. Although love is itself a treasure that we seek, it's also a means by which we seek other treasures. Christian love is not really an emotion, although emotions might be connected with it. It's a form of sacrificial trust in another, as well as a sense of fulfilling the needs of others. A word that's often used uh, to translate the word agape, uh, which is a substitute for love, uh, in scripture is the word charity. Love helps us to look beyond ourselves and our needs and see the needs of others. Okay, but what are these spiritual treasures that Jesus was speaking about? Well, I'm listing the ones that I could think of as I was writing this video. Now, you may have more. You may have different ones that I have, and that's perfectly fine. If you do, I would appreciate it if you could post them below as a comment. But one of the first ones that I, I thought of was generosity. True generosity is not limiting charity to what we have, but to what another needs. And kindness, to truly care about another person. You can give all that you have to charity and still not do it out of kindness. You might be doing it because you think God is watching and he's going to reward you for, that, for this. But this is really selfishness. Kindness is doing it for the sake of the other person, not for your own sake in any way. A third one I thought of was compassion. Compassion is certainly another eternal treasure. It's a lot easier to find fault with people, why they sometimes get themselves into circumstances that they're in, rather than to put that aside and to realize it could have just as easily have been me who made that mistake and got into that situation. We must choose compassion over judgment. Compassion is to be sympathetic to another and to really want to alleviate the problems of another. It's not simply trying to appear to be a good Christian so everyone will think highly of us. It's doing it from the heart, not from the head. Forgiveness, or the ability to forgive, is definitely another treasure. As Jesus said in his own prayer to his Father, we must forgive if we want to be forgiven. But this must be true forgiveness, rather than just doing it for some ulterior motive. I believe that forgiveness 
It's making room for a person to repent for what they've done and to be willing to forego any punishment that they might be owed on account of the offense that they committed against us. I don't think that Jesus meant that forgiveness ought to be something mechanical and that we do it just so that we can be forgiven. I think that he meant that we all are in need of forgiveness and must put ourselves in the shoes of the other person, needing the comfort and the reassurance of being forgiven and given another chance. We must be ready to forgive anyone for anything as this prepares our heart for the love and the forgiveness of God. But keep in mind that the word does not really mean to act as though the sin never happened. It simply cancels the punishment called for. How does having such treasures help us now while we're still here on earth? That's a pretty good question to ask. Do we just have to wait until we go to heaven before we can benefit from these treasures? I think that these treasures give us the ability to overcome things, such as sadness with joy. Now, we all become sad from time to time. I don't think that being a Christian prevents us from being sad. But I do think that being a Christian helps us to cling to what is greater than our sadness. We cling to our hope that God will wipe away all our tears in heaven. And it is this hope that gives us joy. Knowing what it's like to be sad also helps us to have compassion upon those who are sad and suffering. Sadness is transformative because it forces us to see the truth about this world and its consequences. We also have the ability to overcome loneliness with fellowship. That's another way that these treasures can help us right now. Can you believe that even Christians have to deal with loneliness sometimes? It's not so much that we are alone but rather that we feel alone. Sometimes when I don't have the proper Christian fellowship, even though I might be around a lot of other people, I still feel very lonely. In this manner, loneliness might be a motivation for us to come together as a church in fellowship with one another. But sometimes loneliness can help us to get in touch with our deeper inner self if we let it. And like other feelings, it can help us to understand what others are feeling and to transform our loneliness into compassion for others. I think that many times such feelings are given to us just for that reason, to be able to be compassionate towards others. If we don't know what pain and suffering are, how are we to show sympathy and compassion to others who are experiencing pain and suffering? Speaking about suffering, suffering can help us to produce eternal treasures. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And Paul, he certainly understood the value of suffering. We know that from Acts. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, he says this, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know, we don't need to create artificial circumstances to suffer persecution as a Christian, as some seem to be doing today. It's simply existing as a true child of God that warrants others to hate us. 
because we're witnesses to the power of the truth of Christ by the example of our new found righteousness. And Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 3, 14. But and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. And he continues on in chapter 4, verse 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. So even in our suffering, we can bring glory to God. That is our spiritual treasure. But today, many Christians only appear to be persecuted, and not because of their righteousness, but because of their judgment of others. This is not a persecution or the persecution that blesses. I think a lot of times if only the churches had focused upon these treasures, just consider how we are now after 2000, 2000 years of practice. The church is more worried about the sins of the world than their own and their own wealth rather than these treasures. So in summary, we are the children of the promise. Our kingdom is a spiritual one, so our treasures will also be spiritual. Beware of those who make you false promises of wealth that they can't keep or that distract us from the pursuit of the true treasures of our faith. Keep this clear in your mind so that you're not tempted to go after those treasures where the moth and the rust devour and the thieves break into steel. Our treasures are spiritual and will last forever. Thank you for watching and listening and blessings to you all. Bye-bye.